All right, ladies, we're going to start. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the fifth virtual PTA presentations. It's very nice to have you. As you can see, we started, uh, we, we're kind of changing the timelines to see what works. And so we decided to do it during the work day at 10 o'clock. So we thank you for coming. Uh, we have a really exciting presentation on creating a powerful, defensible, defensible brand strategy for your market. And we have a great guest that will be speaking, Jasmine Bina. But before that, I'd like to just go through a few things with you. First of all, I hope you're all healthy and thriving during this time. Uh, as you know, Los Angeles is now going to be on lockdown through the summer. And so we will continue to, to present different uh, virtual presentations that hopefully can help you um, with your current company's uh, state. And we also have some really exciting news today that we're going to talk about a grant that if you fill out some paperwork by tomorrow morning, it's a $5,000 grant that's been given uh, to female entrepreneurs. So we'll talk about that. So we can go to the next slide. So just to highlight again that Pink Talented Angels is a community for female entrepreneurs and investors. We are creating an ecosystem where early stage founders can receive guidance on how to run a company and raise capital. Women supporting women is a win for everyone involved. We're excited that um, we've got some incredible sponsors that are with us this year. And we're hoping that by September, October, we'll be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting with everyone and actually do a proper launch of Pink Talented Angels. Um, so we'll, we'll be in touch with you on all of that. So just to talk a little bit about um, what's happening, we chose Sashi Sandran who is our entrepreneur of this quarter. And we've been working very hard with her. We have uh, already introduced her to UBS for her personal and business planning. She is currently working with Tanya and Josh on social media and brand voice and the strategy around where she's going with her company. Uh, we've been doing some crisis management one-on-one -on -one, and we're really excited to introduce uh, Sashi now to Bran Hagee, who is our legal sponsor, who will actually be helping Sashi with any contracts, anything that she needs to update uh, with this kind of rebuild that we're focusing on for her. So we're really excited to be able to present in the next month the success that we've had mentoring and helping Sashi. She's an incredible entrepreneur and has huge potential with her brand. So thank you to all our incredible sponsors for that. So this is the grant that I was talking about that's really exciting. So Robin Zucker is an angel from Pink Talented Angels. And if you go to the beer a -R, the beer -R foundation.com, it's 5K that you can fill out the paperwork and it's for females that have been impacted by COVID. So we're gonna send this out in an email to everyone, but please go to the website, fill out the paperwork, and you know, 5K, it helps, right? It helps in every way possible. So um, the deadline is tomorrow and today. So I would really look into it today and get your application in and, um, and hopefully, you know, everybody can get the grant. So thank you, Robin, for sending that over. We're really excited about that. So just a couple things. Um, we have the new website up. We're really excited. Uh, the Lizanne Falsetto and Pink Talented Angels went live yesterday. It has an, an incredible amount of information about where we're going as Pink Talented Angels and building this community of females. So please take a look. Um, we're also putting together a newsletter to support our entrepreneurs. That's going to be a Pink Talented Angels marketplace. So if you have stock that you need to move or you have products that you want to sell, 
please send your information to us so that we can put you in the entrepreneurial uh, marketplace category and try to get some sales pushed towards your website. I think uh, as much as we can support each other is, is going to be helpful for all of us. So if you can send over in the next few days information to uh, myself or Jen at lazannefalsetto.com, uh, that would be great. You'll also get an email from us prompting to remind you if you'd like to do that. We're also doing an entrepreneurial spotlight where you send us your information and we will highlight you on our social media tabs and we can cross promote each other and really start building the conversation about what you're doing and who you are. So I think that is all the updates. Now I would like to introduce to you Jasmine Bina. Jasmine Bina is the founder of Concept Bureau. She's a brand strategy agency focusing on B2C lifestyle and tech brands reaching millennial, Gen X, and Gen Z consumers. She's a PR executive turned brand strategist with a deep understanding of narratives that change user behaviors. And I think at this point in time where we're at with COVID, this presentation is going to be extremely timely for you. So please take notes um, on what Jasmine has to talk about. We will do a Q&A after. Um, she also has an incredible podcast that I listened to. I was very impressed. Unseen Unknown. We'll also send that out to you so that you can support her with that. Uh, it's a great, incredible podcast that helps brands unlock new value in changing consumer categories. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Jasmine to Pink Talented Angels. Hi. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for that intro. I'm excited to be talking to you guys today. Um, just so I know, am I going to be um, clicking through or is Danielle? I think Danielle will for you. Okay, cool. Yeah. I think everybody can see me, right? You yep. look great. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Just checking. Okay, great. Um, so we have a lot to talk about. I do want to go through this quickly because I want to be able to answer your guys' questions. So um, let's start by how I want to talk to you guys about the brand landscape today. And it's through dichotomies. Um, we found at our agency that talking about the brand landscape through dichotomies, and when I say dichotomies, I mean contrasts, things that were synonymous at one point but are now starting to diverge. That's kind of the thematic observation that we're having when it comes to brand strategy right now and what we're seeing in the marketplace. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about these dichotomies or divergences through three brand lenses, and they're the market, the consumer, and the channel. I mention this because you may find that one of these lenses makes sense for you, um, and maybe not the other two, and that's fine. But if you really want to create a brand strategy that makes sense for right now, because as we're going to see, things aren't going to change for a while, and there's still going to be a lot of continued uncertainty, you really need to be hitting all three of these levels with your brand. So let's start with the first lens, which is the market lens. And this is the divergence that we're seeing. Business is slowing, but culture is accelerating. I'm gonna explain this to you with an example. So on the next slide, there were two big announcements yesterday. One was that the UC system is going to stay online basically for the rest of the year. And the other one was that the Hollywood Bowl has canceled their entire 2020 season. And I bring this up because these were big announcements that I think are, are kind of signals of things to come for the rest of the year. Um, but really it's our prediction at our agency that everybody and brands and people and leaders keep talking about when this is all over, you know, the before and after, um, you know, when we get to the other side of this. And I think that's really just not the way this is going to play out. Um, we will never really know when we're out of this. It's going to be a long, slow tumbling of closures and failures and cancellations and a lot of adjustments. And we will end up kind of living with the reality of this for the near to medium term future. We don't believe that when we advise our clients about how to build their strategies right now, we don't believe that there is going to be a trigger point where we know that this is all done. And what that means is culture is accelerating. So if you go to the next slide, 
you know, with the Hollywood Bowl and the UC system, suddenly we are having to really, really quickly figure out how do we gather in digital places? How do we learn as a community? You know, we've already started to figure out like, how do we celebrate? How do we eat? How do we work? How do we play? And I bring this up because we really need to appreciate the fact that your consumer's mood is changing week to week. These things, as we come to accept them more and more, are going to accelerate our own feelings. And I think you can see that just through social media. We had bread week where everybody was excited and homely. And then we had the week where it was all about, you know, our teachers and our frontline workers are heroes. And it was a, a mood of vigilance. And then we had workout week, which was a mood about optimism. And then, you know, the week with all the memes about depression and, you know, the, the four day cycle of depression in uh, the quarantine. This is not, you know, these aren't humorous examples. The, the fact of the matter is literally your audience is quick changing that quickly. And that's what has changed with the messaging for a lot of our clients and I, what I want to communicate to you guys today. On the next slide is an example of um, a client of ours, Naked Poppy. They're a clean beauty brand. And they found a way to do two things. One, gauge the mood of their audience on a regular basis. And two, really show sincere empathy. Empathy in a way that goes beyond what we normally hear. So this was a letter that the founder of Jala sent out to her users in their regular newsletter cycle. And it started with a personal story about cancer. And she said that, you know, she was a cancer survivor. And she explained, I don't know what this crisis is going to be like, but I've been through a crisis before. And this is how I know you can preserve yourself in a crisis and how you can get out the other side. And I think there are two lessons, like I said, in this, in this letter. One, if you want to show empathy, these messages of, you know, we're in this together or um, these, these very unique circumstances or any of the kind of templated emails that you're seeing right now, they're not true empathy because you cannot have empathy without vulnerability. Over and over again, we're seeing brands that when they show something vulnerable about the founder, something that shows vulnerability about their operations, about where they are as a business, people really feel that kind of empathy. We're past the one point of empathy. What this also did was she got a flood of emails back. She invited people to respond with their own stories. She got a flood of emails back that helped her gauge where the mindset of her audience was. And she's made this a regular occurrence now, this, this letter. Some weeks your audience is going to be feeling rage. Some weeks they'll be feeling fear, hope, excitement. You know, um, uh, they'll be craving safety or wanting to vent. You can't know unless you throw something out there and see what you get back. So on the next slide, this is what I really want you to take away from this um, dichotomy. There is no empathy without vulnerability. You need to offer the first sacrifice. And that, that's how I describe this, you know, literally offering a, a breadcrumb, something of yourself um, in order to create a safe space for people to, to respond to you. Only show empathy if it's coming through a personal lens or experience. Don't show empathy in empty words. And I think this is, you know, a lot of us are wondering how do you sell without offending or seeing like, seeming like you're capitalizing. I think we're past the initial recoiling of all of this. And people have an appreciation for the fact that businesses, especially small businesses and startups need to survive. But if you want them to understand that you have a passion behind this business, that it's more than just a product, you need to talk to them from a personal space. And when you do that, invite responses in order to gauge the mood. And when you feel, when you get your finger on the pulse of that mood, you need to act on what you learn. So that's the first dichotomy. Let's move on to the second one, which is habits are breaking, but rituals are emerging. This one's a bit more abstract, so I'm gonna explain it through examples again. On the next slide, um, this is a, um, a uh, chart from Perksy, their consumer intelligence agency. And they, they, they come out with great reports. And in this one, they describe that nearly two thirds of millennials and Gen Z have said that they're buying different brands now. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that nearly half of those people who are buying different brands and switching display a, a potential to continue buying those brands even after the pandemic. So if your users churned or if you got new users, it's because their habits around purchasing certain brands have changed. Those are the habits that are breaking. On the next slide, I describe a quote that I think will help us 
kind of guide our discussion around this. And it's by one of my favorite sociologists and brand strategists, Anna, Anna Angelic. And, you know, it's one thing to look at charts like that and they reveal what's already been happening, right? Like we know that people are starting to change brand alliances. We can't have a full discussion about that unless we also see what isn't changing in the landscape. And let me show you something that is remarkably not changing. On the next slide, you may have seen this article in Business Insider where cruise ship bookings, after all of the horror stories that we read about, you know, first, first person accounts of like what people went through, bookings are on track to outpace 2019 right now. 2021 bookings are already outpacing 2019 bookings. And if that doesn't blow your mind, even more surprisingly, um, of all those people who had to cancel their bookings for the year, 76% of them chose not to get a refund. They chose to get a credit for a future uh, um, cruise, uh, cruise experience. How come people are changing brands, but they're not canceling things like cruises? And there's a big difference. Um, on the next slide, it's because rituals fulfill a certain need that habits can't fulfill right now. Cruises have been positioned as a ritual, not a product. But most products are still positioned as habits. I'm going to explain to you what rituals do on the right hand side. And I want you to think about how whether a product fits this bill or whether a ritual fits this bill. So rituals, or excuse me, whether the, the cruise ships fit this bill. A ritual gives us stability and order in times of chaos. They help us sanctify and extract meaning from a situation. They're the backbone of our identities. And most importantly, they help us feel the passage of time. A lot of products haven't been positioned to tell this kind of story, but cruise rides have. And that's why we see this kind of behavior. So what does that mean for us as brands? It means that you need to find a way to couch the discussion of your product, not as a pain point, and there's places for that kind of discussion, but really as signifier of a larger ritual or tradition or, or happening that can help people extract meaning, create routine, understand their identities and feel the passage of time. So let's look at some examples. Um, Oscar Mayer, um, you know, has a product um, and it's very straightforward and they could have easily put out ads around, you know, um, you know, make quick meals for your family with, with our products or, um, you know, feed your hungry kids or, or, you know, take off some of the stress of cooking. These are, are all really smart habit related stories they could have told, but instead they decided to do, decided to do something called the front yard cookout. And it was a campaign on May 2nd where they invite people to, instead of having backyard barbecues, come to their front yards and grill from a socially safe distance from their neighbors and commence in this summer ritual, this ritual of, you know, celebrating the change in, in the air, the kids being out of school. They, they couch their product within that larger narrative. And I'll even say a lot of the images in this campaign didn't even show food. They showed families, they showed laughter, they showed sun-drenched homes. Um, this is how far they were able to take the story. Uh, on the next slide, um, you know, if you can't do something that big, um, there's a brand called Equal Parts. And I'm so sorry, I think somebody has their audio on and I'm, I'm kind of hearing it. If you could just put yourself on mute. Um, anyways, so um, this is Equal Parts. They are a very basic brand. They basically just sell organizing um, items for your home. So, you know, cubbies and folders and things like that. Nothing magical. Um, but they do excellent work with their content. And they started this um, campaign called Space Tapes where um, every week they release a playlist that's been curated by a specific person, some sort of lifestyle influencer. And it's not just songs for the, for the day. They are songs and each song has a story that relates to a time in that person's life. And they're adding gravity to the act of cleaning and organizing. You know, this is about not just cleaning and organizing your home, but your mind and your soul and pausing on what it means to actually do those things. In the next example um, is Dame Products. So Dame is an interesting brand. They're a very high-minded sexual wellness brand for women. They, they basically sell really, really well-designed sex toys. And, um, you know, they have this 
uh, self love Sundays that they've started on their Instagram, where every Sunday they teach you how to take care of yourself and it's ritualized and it's sanctified. And you know, Sunday is a specific day. It's a day for reflection. It's a day for rest. We think of church. We think of holiness. This is about the, the body as a temple and they're selling what you could describe as like a pretty, you know, con you can even say it's controversial or it's, it's, it has a very specific uh, function but they've found a way to ritualize it. And I'm, I'm confident any brand can really do something like this. So to wrap up this, this dichotomy, message for the ritual and not the habit, which is on the next slide. Um, speak to the ritual of experience, not just the habit of the product. Create context around the product and try to hit on one of those things that rituals do, which is offer meaning, routine, a sense of identity, or helping mark the passage of time. And I will say that you can have this throughout your UX, but it really comes to life in content and storytelling. So the last dichotomy is about channels. Retail is ret retracting, D2C is expanding. And this is an important one because two things. One, in the last recession, you'll remember store brands really push a lot of private label, right? And that private label habit never really went away after the economy bounced back. And that's to say that even when retail comes back, it's likely going to be at the disservice of your brand. You're going to have less bargaining power with your retailers. You're probably going to have less control. Um, and so a lot of brands are going D2C, but I want you to understand that D2C is not merely a channel. And what does it even really mean to the consumer anymore? Like they can buy your products D2C through the retail, or yeah, basically online through the retailer pretty easily now in most cases too. It's really that's not what D2C is for the consumer. Instead, it's a certain expectation of experience and messaging. That's what you need to keep in mind if you're moving to D2C. So let's talk about this a little bit. What is the D2C playbook? And there are four really salient points here that you need to understand in order to go D2C. D2C brands, which I'm going to show you in a moment, are extremely vision-oriented and message-led. You might think you have that, and if you do, that's great. But as I go through the examples, I want you to vet your own brand against those examples and ask yourself if you've taken the vision far enough. They promise a personal transformation or a before and after. They make it clear that after you use this product, you will be a different, better version of yourself. Um, and when it comes to their actual products, they focus on the different, not better story. So better is, you know, what we talk about a lot of times with our features, with our products, faster, cheaper, easier, um, won the most awards, has the longest heritage. Those are all better stories. Different stories focus on what makes a very unique experience out of this product. And when they do all those things, they create new meaning in a category. I'm going to explain this and we're going to get into it deeper and deeper with examples. So this is Hymns. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hymns. They're an extremely successful breakout brand. And on the surface, Hymns looks like they're really changing the story of masculinity, right? They sell products like um, erectile dysfunction medicine or um, hair loss uh, serums, or even medicine that you could take for anxiety around public speaking. And they're not really just male oriented products. Like if you look at what really threads all those products together, it's that they're all very shame based. There's shame in using those products. And what HIMSS has done is that they've used a very distinct vocabulary to move away from shame and instead to gratitude and celebration. They don't, um, they don't make you feel like you can't talk about these things. They create space for you to talk about them and to feel um, not just empowered and, and confident, but grateful for the spectrum of the male experience. There's a lot of touchy-feely language in this. It's couched in humor. And it's very succinct, but it's very, very effective. And what does this do? It helps you experience the real value of the product before you even buy the product. It helps you feel all the things that the product will help you feel before you even have to convert. And that's what you need to do with your messaging. Surface the experience, the greater experience, not the functional benefits of your product, but the personal transformative almost worldview benefits, the vision-led benefits that your product offers. This is distinctly D2C. If we go to the next example, we have The Ordinary. I think a lot of you probably know what The Ordinary is. They were such a great brand example for, for so many brands, but I wanna decode The Ordinary for you a little bit because their brand language was so specific. This was a really common product page on the site. Um, 
you can't use the ordinary if you don't know how to use it. There is no like day cream and night cream. There are no like um, products that are um, marketed to fit together necessarily. If you combine the wrong products, you're gonna burn your skin, which I did. When you go to the ordinary, it's a lot of like really medical and clinical language. I had to research this brand and join Reddit groups and, and, and spend a week learning about skincare before I could figure out what my regimen was and purchase my products. They forced me to become a skincare expert and speak the language of a dermatologist. They forced me to change through their language, through their packaging, through the way that they sold. And I had this realization, oh, the expert isn't the dermatologist. It's not the brand. I am the expert. And once you go through that change, you start to qualify all of their competitors along a very different set of USPs. And you're a very, you feel empowered around something which is usually very disempowering. And they did all of this through language. And I know that this can be scary for some brands because you're going to turn some people away. But this is the kind of D2C narrative that you're up against. This is stuff where if people make it through the hurdles, they are very committed to a brand. And that's what it means to buy the ordinary through the ordinary's website instead of buying it through, I don't know, Sephora. I don't even know if they're at Sephora, but I know that they're, they're um, definitely available at um, some, some retailers. That's why people choose to buy from them and not from other places. The next example here is Noom. I don't know if any of you have used Noom. They advertise a lot on television in Southern California, but they're an app and they're a weight loss app. And these are some screenshots from the user experience once you're in the app. And here's what's interesting about Noom. They act like a weight loss app, but really it's a mental wellness app. And they do it through their voice. When, they get, when you get into Noom, into the nitty gritty, they talk to you from two voices. Sometimes they talk to you from a voice that sounds a lot like your own. You know, and I've screenshotted some of this language. Like, I'm lazy. I, I, I can't take care of myself. I'm a loser. They use language like that. Um, and they, they, they kind of bring all that kind of like hidden language to the surface. Other times they talk to you like a therapist. Um, it's almost like the, the app gives you a pep talk. This is not about counting calories, although that's part of the, the, you, the, the, the experience. You do have to log your food. You do have to log your weight. You do have to check in with the coach. But the voice that they've chosen and the experience that they've created forces you to drop your old biases about weight loss at the door and just come to this with a new frame of thought. I'm giving you different examples. Some are UX, some are product packaging, some are website. This one is content, the next one. Um, this is Wealth Simple's blog. They have an amazing feature on their blog called Money Diaries. And they speak with famous people about how they got rich. And they always center it around a pivotal point where something along the lines of the celebrity lost everything. And then they had, a, they had a, an epiphany. And then they really started to build their fortunes. And they do a great job of showing how these people have like, they weren't, you know, they may have been rich, but they, they have, almost all of them have one super, super low. And when they come out of that low, they come out of it a changed person. And if you read between the lines of these stories, you'll see that the reason why these people were able to finally amass wealth and not lose it again, was because they discovered that money is not about your net worth, it's about your self-worth. When they started respecting themselves, they were able to treat money very, very differently. And you come to understand that this content is really engineered to help you remove your judgment around money so that you use the product very differently. And the last ex example here really quickly is social media. This is, this is an older example um, in Square. Um, you know, they, they had a while this campaign where they were taking a lot of the stats from their um, purchase data and pulling stories from them. So the fact that, you know, Square Sellers had seen a 1500% rise in celery juice, that's when like the celery juice craze was happening last year, the avocado toast thing. If you look at, again, if you infer from the story that they're telling in their social posts, they're telling these entrepreneurs, you are not subject to the economy. You are the economy. You are the fabric of ma what makes this world work. Now, when you come to a brand like Square, which, I mean, there are options for you out there when it comes to payment processing. And you're really just looking for the most frictionless, best price um, uh, offering. 
But when there's a brand that also offers you this larger picture, this larger story, it, it forces a different kind of relationship. And again, they're very much playing D to C. So all these are, are examples of what the D to C code is, which at, the, at this next slide I describe is really about making new meaning. Ask yourself, in your messaging, are you making new meaning for your users? Are you making people relate to themselves and the world differently? Are you focusing on the vision and like gently pushing people into this future vision that you have? Are you focusing on being different first and better second? This is what D2C is about. So this was, I went through this really quick. Um, this is, these are the three biggest dichotomies we're seeing that we hope will help inform your decisions as, as brand owners. And I just wanna leave you with one last thought before I answer questions and that it's, it's really time to take big swings. My partner and I have talked about this a lot and we feel like, yes, you know, you have to be sensitive to your audience, of course. But this is also a time where users have a real latitude they are willing to let you step out of your lane and try something new. They will not see your failures as an embarrassment. They will see it as a very human attempt to try to make some sort of normalcy and progress out of what we're going through right now. So I would encourage you to, to be creative and open-minded and take a little more risk when it comes to your brand elements. And that's that. Fantastic, Jasmine. Thank you. So well said and put together. You did a fantastic job. You know, it's interesting when you said, you know, empathy and vulnerability in a crisis is crucially important. Do you think it's just because of, you know, people are touching in on themselves to be able to really focus on that during COVID? And do you think that moving forward, keeping that thread of vulnerability and empathy through your brand is key to really keeping that conversation going? Yeah, I think right now people need to see it because they're buying things very differently. I, I do believe you always want your consumer to buy emotionally, but now they really are buying emotionally. Right. And you know, they just want to know that when they're purchasing those things, that there's a reason for it, that, that, that um, you know, there was always such a distinct and obvious reason for buying things before. But now some of that's missing a little bit. And I think when they can see a person behind the brand, when they understand like what a company is trying to achieve, um, it just makes the disconnect a little smaller. It, it, it lessens the friction of like, should I be buying something right now in a, in a time of crisis? Now, as far as whether this should, this will continue, um, definitely in the medium term, you don't need to send out like a really emotional, heartfelt like letter that exposes something about yourself every week. But you do need to find ways to gently remind people that there are people behind this company and that, um, you know, we are constantly checking in just to see where you're at, that you care about the user. Um, and you will need to do it so long as there is uncertainty in the world, because there's no, I don't I don't know that there's a more efficient way of gauging the mentality of your users right now than to just throw something out there and see what you get back. Yeah. Could it be the same, like the woman that said about the breast cancer, would the, every time she talks to that, could it be, rep, you know, over and over and over instead of finding something new and keep yeah, you know, focused yeah. on it? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, if you take a rich story and you offer pieces of it and you kind of serialize it over time, or you know, it doesn't always have to be in the newsletter, you can provide breadcrumbs. So like maybe one time it's in the newsletter and another time it's on social and then it's like in the UX and then it's right. on the checkout page, whatever. You can offer people different bits of it um, and then give them a place to go to if they want to go deeper. This is just like a regular best practice in brand strategy. If people want more, you have to offer them a place to get it. So she should park or whoever should park like these larger stories in a blog post or, um, you know, somewhere where like, if people want to connect more deeply, they can do that. Maybe it's through like video content or something. But I think we're finding that people, um, what I'm seeing at least when we're looking at like social and like consumer behavior is that um, people are valuing these things and they're using it to validate their purchases. That's why this whole push to like save your local restaurant and order local, even though it's not the safest thing, yeah. right? Like you're still exposing yourself, but the, the story of supporting your local restaurant has completely supplanted the safety story. Um, but it doesn't quite make sense. It doesn't entirely add up, but people are willing to accept it. Yeah. 
Well, let's open it up. Um, ladies, any questions for Jasmine? Um, I have a question about building community. So uh, can you talk about how the ways that you've seen brands build community? Um, is it through um, like Slack or um, I don't know, like email groups or message boards? Like how, how do you communicate with your audience most effectively and then allow them to communicate with themselves? Yeah. So um, community has been a tough one right now because there is so much noise out there, right? Like if you open Instagram, you're going to get nonstop notifications for Instagram lives that are happening. And I'm just astounded at some of these brands that have millions of followers, but they won't even get like 0.005% of their audience to like tune into an Instagram live. Um, and I think like if you want to build community at a time like this, like it's not so much about the platform, like definitely there are Slack groups. Um, you can definitely do it on Facebook. It's not so much platform specific. It's about what are you bringing your, your people around to talk about? It's not just a community around your brand. It shouldn't just be a community about like how to use the products. Um, I think Branch Basics has done this pretty well in some of their social, and I don't know if they have like a private group or not, or, or Parsley Health is another great one. So um, uh, they've started, I think it's a Facebook group where you can go and talk about and kind of vet um, uh, health practices for COVID and not just any health practices, but like, you know, if you're pregnant, what should you be doing right now? Um, if you're living with an elderly person and Parsley Health is interesting. They're a functional medicine brands. I, I'm, I'm one of their users. Like I, I, I I'm on, the, on the, their annual functional medicine plan. And, um, you know, you kind of get access to these doctors that are talking to you very one-on-one. -on -one. Anything that you can create that gives people a sense of access to the source, like access to somebody who can give them the information or the help or the discussion, or even just like the sounding board that they need, I think that's where I've seen the most people congregate. Another brand that's doing this really well is Loom. So they're, a lot of you may know them. They're an, a, 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 they're really, a, they're actually a physical space um, for women's wellness. It's founded by a celebrity doula. There's a lot of stuff around like pregnancy and, and miscarriage or abortion or starting a family. And they've had to go completely digital. Um, but Erica Chidi Cohen, the founder, she has brought her unique voice online. She's very direct. There is absolutely no shame, no holds barred um, conversations with her. And she's created spaces for people to still have those kinds of experiences. But you get a strangely um, intimate connection with her because she's just offering herself there. It's not like a team of people that are, that are talking about this thing, uh, these kinds of things. And I think, I think it doesn't matter what your platform is. It matters that... Um, you are giving it the time and the attention to like make people feel like they're getting kind of unprecedented access to you. That's just where I'm seeing the most activity. A lot of these brands that have like DJ sessions um, or, um, you know, have like lives where they're like interviewing an expert about something. I just don't see too much engagement there. And I watch them all day, every day. And it's just, that's not where the numbers are. Yeah, and along those lines, I mean, you're seeing a lot of brands do workout sessions, um, like you said, the DJ sessions, like, it, does it make sense to do things that are a little bit off brand right now? So even moving into products, like selling hand sanitizer and masks when your core product might be um, like a protein bar or something? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that kind of you know, that's just like a morality question. If you, if, I think as, as a brand that has certain values, you're going to be compelled to do those things. I don't think you necessarily need to tie them to your new brand story, unless it's going to be like part of a pivot in the business. But those are, I think, just tactical things that you do because you're a brand that wants to help people value those things. But you know what? They've become table stakes now. If you want to keep building your brand at this point, that stuff that's like a requirement. Now you have to start building like the larger story on top of that. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Very well said. Anybody else have any questions they'd like to throw out to Jasmine? I just have a comment about the anti-back. What the vendors are telling us, I'm obviously in the cosmetic industry, that they think it's not going to go away, everybody using anti-back, some form of that. 
So it's going to be like how lip balm has been added to every skincare line or a cleanser is a mainstay. You would never launch a skincare line without a cleanser. Not that just because everybody uses one, right? So there's the telling to us what your brand message, if you're a clean brand or if you're a brand that uses, I don't know, you know, an orange scent through the whole thing, you, you will apply that to your anti-back and it will just be a staple in your line um, because a consumer might look at you, how can you launch a skincare line and not have someone to, something to protect my hand. So it's interesting how quickly it's changing. I'll give you one other thing. In the last six weeks, color cosmetics has been down, depending on what you read, 25, 30%. In the last six weeks, Mascara, eyeliner, under eye cream, I can give you a list because everybody's wearing a mask, lipsticks are down, and everybody's just focusing on their eyes in six weeks time. So it's a whole new world out there. I, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. That antibacterial thing also is, uh, I mean, now that you say it, I feel like I can't unsee it. It's very true. Yeah, it is true. Hi, Deanna. Nice I have a question. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, everyone. Hi. All right. Any other questions? I have one. Uh, Suzanne. Hi. Hi, Darla. Um, thank you so much, Jasmine. Fantastic. So do you have any other tread, trend consultancy agencies that you follow? I follow Sparks and Honey and also Lee Edelcourt you know, one of time's mm -hmm. most influential people. Do you have any um, sources where you get some of your trend forecasting reports that you use that you could share? Oh gosh, you know, we just, I'm on the newsletter list for so many. Um, I do a lot of like um, uh, industry specific ones, which I don't know would be necessarily um, uh, valuable to you guys. So I definitely follow Stylist. Um, I follow Hartman. Um, and I follow um, Food Tech Connect. They also have, I, I think food is such a leading indicator of how people are, are kind of perceiving like self-care and wellness. And we work with all those brands um, that I follow those ones. I can see if I have more um, that we pull any kind of reporting from. And I could send that out afterwards if you like. But yeah. off the top of my head, those are the ones. Yeah, what we'll do, Jasmine, is we'll add that to the email list. If you want to give two or three sure. of those, that would be great. Um, I will anything we can do to help support our, our pink talented angels for sure. And I love Marty Neumeyer. I don't know if you ever follow him. Yes, 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 I do. You're right. That's another good one. Fantastic. Any other questions? Um, yes, actually I have one. I just wanted to thank you Jasmine for today. It's been great. Um, also, I would like to know how often should a brand communicate? How often do they need to communicate right now with their audience? You know, I would say it depends. I know that's like a really crappy answer. Um, it depends on like what you're selling and the kinds of relationships people have with your brand. But generally, it feels like you should be communicating a little bit more than usual. And you should be making each of those communications count. So, you know, it's okay if you've started your sales campaigns again, but they can't just be standalone sales campaigns. It still feels weird when I get an email from Old Navy or The Gap about a sale with no discussion of what's going on. Um, I think people still need the context. They still need to know that you're paying attention to this and that you care. Um, but I think if I had to give you like a rule of thumb, enough so that you feel like you always know where your pe people are at. So that might be once a week, once every two weeks, once every month. But so that when you put something out there and you get a response, you feel like at any given point in time, you know the mood of your audience because different audiences are going to be in different moods. You know, we work with parenting brands, their audiences change week to week. We work with beauty brands, their audiences change week to week. Enough so that you feel like I said before, you have your finger on the pulse of your audience. And you know, with that too, Jasmine, actually tracking that and watching the trends of that is really yeah, of course. important, right? Looking at the times you're executing it, the days that, you know, is Tuesday better than Friday and then tracking it and keeping, you know, that in line with the way you make your decisions of communication because people are getting fatigued. There's, you know, Zoom fatigue. They're sitting on our butts fatigue. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it's really exhausting, right? And I think yeah. really being able to track 
the message. But I think right now, the opportunity for us as business uh, you know, leaders is to really focus on where is the opportunities and how do we dig into those and how do we look ahead instead of looking back, right? It's gonna be after COVID, right? After yeah. COVID and how do we think about that? Um, so with that in mind, I would just like to mention one, uh, Kalika's book is an incredible book. It's called The Little Brand Book. And I would really recommend, you know, purchasing it on Amazon. Um, very proud of you, Kalika. This is really great. Congratulations. And, check, and check out Lizanne's fantastic, beautiful photo inside. She's one of the influencers. Oh, my photo. Thank you. It's my beautiful. Words. My words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, ladies. So, Jasmine, that was really, really, really good. incredible and great takeaways. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, Good job. And if there's anything we can do to help you, Jasmine, like, let us know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. I appreciate that. So we'll be sending out your information if you're okay with that on sure. a mail blast and the slides for the ladies to enjoy. Uh, we'll actually be up on my website, lizannefalsetto.com. Let's all support each other on social media in any way possible. Um, again, if you have items you want to sell, please make sure in the marketplace of the next newsletter, we really want to help support you. And I'll also send it out to my YPO. I have 5,000 um, on my email list to try to push as much product as we can for you. So make sure you get that in. There'll be a date of when that deadline will be, uh, which will be next Tuesday. And again, if you'd like to be highlighted as a pink talented angel, uh, on our social tabs, please also send us your information and, and we would love to support you there. So with that, charge through your week and your day, stay healthy, and thank you again for being a Pink Talented Angel. <laughs>